vivid, rich, and verdant green, the dense shade of a forest canopy in summer gives way to a clear, bright, gold light until summer's decline, leaving the spectacular colors of autumn in its wake. Leaves fall, winds blow, leaving the striking bare silhouettes of giants, rough in the distant glitter of the wintry sun until it all begins again each new year with the blooming of spring's petals and soft pastels. The beauty of our state is unmistakably visible in its trees. Magnificent and worn, these champion trees are the largest and grandest of their kind, a living emblem of the splendor of our geographic heritage. The sublime majesty of these towering trees can arrest our attention. And in their presence, one can even feel caught up and suspended in a moment of wonder, shocked at the immensity of these trees and standing in awe of nature's beauty. It is in such moments of splendid vision that we truly recognize why these trees are called champions. In front of our farmhouse was a wooded area that we called the woods, and that was my playground. I would spend hours out there by myself. I would daydream, I would make up stories, all under these trees, and it was a magical place for me, a wonderful place. Anyone that's around trees as a child feels that enchantment. We know all about the enchanted forest. We read about it in fairy tales. And I think that's just something that somehow is within us, certainly in our childhood. And so that's how I still think about trees. I think they're even more magical now that I know all the properties and everything, how important they are to the world. But at the time, it was just the beauty and the unknown. They were magical. And I feel like this project with the trees is almost a, a circular part of my life coming back to say thank you to the part that they had in my life as a child. landscapes, flowers, is I, I appreciate the beauty and I appreciate the nature and my depiction of it or drawing of it is my expression of gratitude in some way for the beauty of this. So, it's just been fascinating. It's been a journey for me of learning. I've just always been fascinated with trees. You know, when I was younger, I was always going through the forest and playing and beating sticks against trees, and, you know, hitting rocks. And, you know, climbing trees and just acting like a uh, young boy would do. Well, uh, the Forestry Commission, they're, they are the ones that maintain the list of trees that are champions in the state of Arkansas. And uh, I'm not sure on the history on that, but I think they started about 20 years ago or so maintaining a list. And uh, since then, pretty much every state in the South has a list of champion trees as well as out west. And uh, our major role is if a landowner thinks they have a champion tree and they call us about it, we'll go out there and measure it. 
and verify whether or not it is a champion tree. I was really impressed with it when I first seen it. Did you find it, or has it always been here? Well, I had it on the list. It has gotten lost on the list since then. But I remeasured it, made sure it was a uh, true champion. And uh, when we show up on site, there's three main measurements that we'll have to get. And one is total height, the other one is circumference in inches, and the other one is crown spread and all that fit into a formula to come up with the bigness index, and that's how the trees are ranked based on the bigness index. Yeah, the thing to do on this one is to find the smallest diameter uh, between, the, between all the branches in the ground. Am I looking pretty level? That is 87.3 inches diameter. You know, we don't see trees of champion status everywhere in the state just because the champion trees are just truly unique. 59. These champion trees are really fascinating because they're the largest and uh, a lot of them just they have really neat shapes and uh, they're cool to look at and they're pretty awesome to just marvel at how large they are. If there's any tree that I've had a uh, just an awestruck with, it would be the champion bald cypress. And uh, that was the first champion tree I ever visited. I visited it probably about five years ago. And uh, so I went out there, was just walking around, and when I come up on it, it was like, wow, that's incredible. It, uh, just by far the largest tree I've ever seen. And it is the largest tree in the state. So that just kind of kind of fed uh you know most of the champion trees were you know were running three four hundred years old and uh for a tree to get you know missed by uh missed by a saw or a bulldozer or lightning or a windstorm for that long is just uh it makes these things really unique but uh there are a lot of very large trees within the state of arkansas and uh you know, there's a lot of great places to go to see these large trees. A lot of folks find trees fascinating. We all have a memory of uh, playing around a tree or having a picnic under a tree or climbing a tree. Who am I? That is the question. I'm just an ordinary person that's got extraordinary aptitudes toward plants of all kinds. I read about the Don Redwood in a garden magazine. They profiled the tree and uh, it's related to our native cypress tree. So I thought, well, since a cypress tree would grow here, the Don Redwood should grow here. But I, I've sent off and got the, the tree. It came in, it was maybe three or four feet tall. And uh, I improved the soil where I planted the tree, was going to plant the tree. So I planted it, didn't think it would ever mount anything. And uh, 
20 years later, it's doing real, real well. Sometimes it seemed like when I was off work that all I did was work in my yard. It can be uh, almost intoxicating. You know, you, you, can, uh, you can get so interested in doing your gardening and landscaping that you uh, tend to slack off on other things that you need to be doing. <laughs> Well, I, I grew up in a quiet little town off minding its own business nowadays. And in the summer, my brother and I and my two cousins, we'd just ride our bicycles out in the country and we'd see a tree. We'd pull our bicycles over. We'd just go over and we'd just climb all the trees we could find. We would always see how, who could climb the highest. We had a game where we would uh, climb smaller trees and we'd get up to the top of it and we'd get it swinging and if we could get it pulled over we would tie it down with a rope and one person would, would get on the tree and we would cut the vine or the rope and see how far it would swing it. Sometimes it went pretty good ways. But as far as the champion champion trees goes, I didn't always know that I, w I was intentionally setting out to plant a champion tree. Although that, I think that is, an, it's like an ultimate achievement for myself to grow a tree l a bigger or larger than anybody else has. It's in my blood. I love their uh, uh, the way the limbs look against the sky, and I love the play of abstract against the realistic. I love the idea of the earth and the nature that the trees represent. I think of them as uh, tree portraits because each tree not only has its own look and shape and everything, but every tree has its story too. So how am I going to capture this magnificence, this size, this, this feeling? And when I look at it, how am I going to capture that so that the viewer perhaps can just get a, a taste of what it's like to stand in front of this tree? Prior to extensive settlement, about 96% of the state of Arkansas was considered forest of some type. And, and most of the tree species we'd have at that time would be very similar to what we see nowadays. So we would have the pines, we'd have the various hardwoods, oaks, hickories, gums. Uh, you'd have bald cypress in a lot of the wet, wetter areas. And so the, in many places, the species composition hasn't really changed very much, but in a lot of them, the, the stand conditions have changed.
Champion trees are relatively unusual nowadays uh, in, in many ways because we don't have a lot of big trees uh, left in the woods anymore. Uh, certainly not like we would have had in, in historic times. And so from a rarity standpoint, I mean, typically a state only has one or perhaps two champion trees uh, for any given species of trees. Uh, and so from that standpoint, there, there's not a lot of them out there. The advent of photography made it possible to capture uh, a number of examples of what some of these very large trees would have looked like. Some of the historical accounts that we have uh, by some of the early explorers and land surveyors and, and other people that were, were actually eyewitnesses to these trees uh, talked about some of them being five, six, perhaps eight feet in diameter or more. Uh, some of the bald cypress in particular could have been 10, 12, perhaps even 14 or 15 feet in diameter, depending on you know, the locations that they were at. So they would have been much larger than you typically see uh, in the forest nowadays. And we have a, a number of, of examples where we've got uh, people standing next to some of these trees uh, and, and the people are definitely dwarfed by the individuals. A um, lot of trees, of course, that uh, they took pictures of were right after they had been cut down. Uh, and so a lot of times they're standing next to trees that are as big a cross as the people are tall. So it gives you kind of a, a feel for the scale of some of the trees that were there. For many people, that's, that's what it is. It's like a, a trophy deer. They'd like to have that kind of trophy that they could put on their wall, if you will. There is only a tiny fraction of old growth forest left in the state of Arkansas uh, compared to what there would have been uh, in historic times. Um, we still have small stands that, uh, that could be rightly called old growth forest. Some of the best examples of old growth forest are found still in some of the mountainous areas, the Ozarks and the Washita's. We have some of them in uh, some of the bottomland hardwood areas, some of the really wet uh, portions of the state, the, the deep swamps, if you will, uh, because those were so hard to, to access and to, to log. Um, some of those have been protected. The relative rarity of these very large trees in many ways is, um, is, is so unique but they, you may be surprised by uh, how frequently you, you may run across them. Uh, a lot of times they are, are noticed in, in places like uh, uh, people's backyards, uh, in public parks, uh, even cemeteries. Maple Hill was originally known as Evergreen Cemetery. The original cemetery here in Helena that was used as part of the battlefield during the Battle of Helena on July 4th, 1863, there were humongous artillery shells hitting the cemetery that were destroying the ground, the graves in the ground, they were destroying the headstones. The cemetery really exists as a secondary site to reinter the original citizens of Helena. Before the Civil War, Helena had a lot of trees. Uh, we had a lot of virgin forest. As the Federals occupied the, uh, the city of Helena during uh, 1862 and 1863, a lot of the trees were removed. You do have a few trees around here that would have survived. The ginkgo is the most visible landmark uh, object in that cemetery, one of the most popular views from Helena is, is going up on the ridge at the Confederate Cemetery and, and seeing all of the foliage. You have a lot of oranges from the other trees. 
but you have a contrast here with the with the yellows and it, it is definitely one of the most visible out there that tree has been part of the, the landscape there since the beginning that tree would have seen all the shakers and movers of Helena. The tree has seen Helena at its height. Back when we had, you know, multiple train depots, we had, you know, thousands and thousands of citizens here, thriving businesses. The tree would have seen a lot of the downfall of Helena. If these trees could talk, well, what, what would they say, you know? <laughs> One of the more important things about the cemetery is the fact that the whole cemetery is a battlefield. So by going out to Maple Hill, you're stepping back in time and you're seeing these names that have been largely forgotten. So that's another reason, aside from the fact that there are bodies buried there, people died there. So it's double special. And then the ginkgo is just icing on the cake when it comes to the whole aspect of this history. You've got natural and American history together, and it's just the perfect place to come visit. Native Americans had a uh, of course, a different relationship to the land and to the forest than, than a lot of the Europeans and American settlers and, and uh, peoples that would have come afterwards. In many ways, you know, they were, they were users of the, of the forest. It provided fuel for their fires. It provided structure, wood for their lodgings. They would have gotten medicines, tools, fiber, all, all sorts of different uh, practical uses. Uh, would have been provided by the trees in the forest and other plants and vegetation. And so, I mean, they were consumers like just about everybody else. They consumed at a, at a different level and, and had different particular uses. We have a lot of history here in Darnell. It, at one time, there was 80,000 Indians, according to the newspaper in 1876. They, they liked it because they had a good lookout from Darnell Rock to see, I guess, to make sure they weren't being surrounded by somebody and then had good water. And that's where they settled. Where the Indians met years ago before the white people were in here, that was their meeting ground. This Council Oaks has been estimated to be 350 years old. It's a white oak. It's always been the council oaks because that was the council site for the Indians. That's where they have their council meetings. That was where the Indians met. But the history books will say a grove of trees. So undoubtedly, the council oak is the only one that has survived so long. And of course, I'm sure they cut a lot of them. Now, they say they met there for a treaty in 1823, but I think it was later than that, and when the Cherokee agreed to give up all land west of the Mississippi. Crittenden was the acting governor at that time, and he's the one that Black Fox kept scooting down the log. They were sitting, they, they felled trees to sit on for their meeting, and he kept scooting Crittenden down till he got to the end of the log. And he said, I, there's no more room left. He told Chief Black Fox, and Chief Black Fox said, well, that's the way we feel. They had been moved so many, so many times, they didn't have any room, anywhere to go. I think it's a big attraction. It's had, it's had uh, tables, picnic tables, and, and uh, a grill for years and years. They have swing sets for the kids. We have all these markers under the tree. My children crowd ran up there for arrowheads when they were little. And uh, I don't know about other people, but to me, it's just something to be real proud of. 
It'll always go down in history as being the size of tree it was in the age it is. And I'm very fortunate that I know as much history about it as I do. And I never did like history as a kid. But I do now. <laughs> I research that history all the time. Rather than trying to capture the whole tree, I will focus in on something that I feel is important, like a pattern in the trunk, or very often the roots that go down into the ground. I think that's really interesting. The excitement of seeing the uh, the possible, or thinking about the possible drawing that you're going to do, the air, the sounds, that's all the experience. So if you haven't experienced that, that's difficult to finally decide on which one I really think is the composition that I want to use or what I want to work from for my drawing when I'm looking at the trees. And as I'm drawing the tree, I'm thinking of it as, okay, what's unique about this tree? What really pulls me in? What's special about this particular tree? I wanted to be able to really capture the texture of the trunks and the delicateness of the leaves and I just felt more comfortable in and visualizing it I guess uh, in pencil but the colored pencil brings the color into it color is very strong it depicts mood it's that feeling of awe, that, that uh, feeling of peace. So my process is to layer color over color and build up these wonderful natural colors. They become richer and deeper. When you start working, I'm not thinking I'm going to pick up this red pencil and do this or I'm going to do this. It's this ongoing process. You're almost in a zen mode that uh, it all progresses and works together and I'm not thinking one, two, three, this, this, this. I may get started on a drawing and three or four hours go by and I don't even know it. You're just in a zone. And I've spoken with other artists and I know this is a very common thing. You're in that zone, you're in that creative mode to where it's almost as if something else is working through you. And it's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful freeing feeling. Creative energy that is almost flowing through you to where, as I say again, you're not specifically thinking I'm going to pick this color up and do this it's just something that's flowing I prefer to think of it as the God energy that's flowing through you 
other people think of, you know, other things, but to me, that's what it is. The tree is the largest object we often see in the landscape. Being close to a large, gigantic champion tree, you feel small. You feel powerless for a moment. But in that feeling, there's a kind of exhilaration because there's a knowledge that there's something bigger than yourself. Artists want to tap into the kinds of uh, temporalities that the, the tree uh, represents. Artists are attracted to trees. Some are fascinated by the symmetrical nature of trees. You look up into the branches and they're like little fractals, um, piercing the heavens in a myriad of different patterns, but mathematical patterns, organized patterns. There's a sense of design in those patterns. Leonardo da Vinci was fascinated by the branches of the tree. Each daughter branch uh, if there's four or five daughter branches of a single branch, the surface areas of those daughter branches add up to that parent branch. Um, that kind of organization is a symbol of a kind of seeming design to things. It's a way of feeling rooted in nature, and thus becomes a symbol that the artist is attracted to. The beauty of the tree has been an organizing principle since the dawn of man. When humans started to come into consciousness, it was the trees that they saw first. The tree is not only a natural object, it's something that organizes the imagination. The tree, in many different traditions, is considered to be the focal point around which the entire cosmos revolves. In Norse mythology, Trees are significant. Uggdrasil, the world tree, is an organizing principle. It holds up the heavens. Um, it goes down into the underworld. It's where Midgard, where Earth, where humans also live in the, in towards the middle of the trunk. It's said that um, Odin and his brothers took two trees, made them male and female, and these were the parents of humans. Within Christianity, there's at least two important trees. The first the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Eden. This is the tree that Adam and Eve eat from, the cross, which is often thought to be made of from the wood of the dogwood tree. The dogwood tree perhaps is chosen because the blossom of the dogwood, the little flowers look like crosses, white crosses often. And if one looks closely, one might see little red tinges on the edges, which may signify the blood of Christ. But trees more generally organize our lives. For those of us who grow up or have roots in where we've grown up, the trees we, that were there when we were born are likely to be there when we die. There's the sense that the tree endures um, in, in terms of generation. There's a way for communities to reflect upon how long they've endured by having these sort of central places where communities can gather around. And it's this organization across the generations that allowed trees to in some way be a bridge um, across time and space. You know, the, the trees, they all have a story. And uh, what's even neater than that is that the people that own the trees have a story also. Just seeing the history of uh, a particular tree on someone's property is pretty interesting. I'm Wadeen Foreman Hilliard, and I was born at Rosebud, Arkansas. Well, actually, Bethesda. And um, Mom planted a holly tree. My dad bought a farm, and they started farming. 
then my mother started having children. One, two, three, four, five, in six years. And I was the youngest. My sister in New Hampshire, okay, that's my oldest sister. She and I are the only ones living now. Well, that was our tree. I really liked it. Liked it, and I was proud of it. Well, my parents planted it uh, when I was a baby, I think. And uh, my first uh, picture of it, I was at a carriage after they planted it. Baby carriage, I guess you'd say. <laughs> It was just a little stick out in the corner of the yard. And Mom made it clearer to each of us, you are not to step on it. You'll kill it. And she said, if you'll let it grow, it'll be a big tree. And sure enough, we let it grow, and it became a big tree. It was pretty special. It was special to us, too, because I used to climb on this tree, but it didn't grow fast enough to suit me, because I wanted it to get big so I could climb it. And finally, it did. But you just really had to s squeeze yourself in when you went through narrow passages in it, because it had a lot of limbs. And it was fun to climb. But you had to be careful, because those holly Leaves had stickers on them, and you'd get stuck. We used to cut branches off of it for Christmas decorations to put in the house. Oh, we were breaking the limbs off with the red berries to decorate in the house and make a wreath for the front door of the, the tree in the snow. It, it's a pretty tree. It just was a nice tree, and it was always there, just like my parents were there for us. It makes me feel old. After all, if that tree's grown that much, years have passed, and so have they for me. None of us looks young and spry. But that's all right. That's part of life. A lot of these folks that I'm meeting, they, their great great grandpa planted the tree, or they, you know, the tree's always been there, and it's kind of a landmark to their property. And uh, you know, folks just have a real deep bond with trees. They, uh, they're real special to people. My name is uh, Tom Boswell, and. Uh, we're in Waldo, Arkansas, and uh, the tree behind me is the largest post oak tree in the state of Arkansas. It's uh, been measured by the Forestry Commission, and it's a legitimate champion tree. There's been two weddings under this tree. There's been a bunch of different parties of different kinds under these trees. School functions and church functions and all kinds of functions. It's uh, been in my family just about ever since I can remember. When I was 
planting cotton and corn here with my dad one day, and he said that uh, when he first got this place, it was two trees this size only, and he said a storm came through and blew that tree there down, which was about the same size as this tree here and the same kind of tree. And so him and a bunch of men got together and they cut that tree up for firewood. And while they were cutting it up, they counted the rings. And that tree that they cut up had 200 rings in it, which meant it 200 years old. And that was probably in 1949 or sometime shortly after the war. But uh, the old tree has not changed in my lifetime. I haven't seen any changes in it other than it's, it's getting to where it stays the same and I'm the one that's aging. I'm going to show you that picture that the, the paper took. Yeah. And that way you got an idea of the size of it. That's the way most of the people found out about it around here being a record is because when the paper published it, everybody knew it was a record and never thought about it before. The day they published that picture, there's a picture in the paper of me and a gorilla. And everybody says they couldn't tell any difference. They wanted to know which was which. <laughs> when I'm standing here with my hand on the tree like that, it kind of gives you an idea the, the tree. And uh, in my mind, it's, it's at least 250 years old. And until somebody tells me different, I'm going to believe what my daddy told me. This, uh, this tree here is the most valuable thing on the property. <laughs> The uh, Forestry Commission has been placing markers uh, in front of several of these champions. And the main type criteria we're going by is, uh, is a tree in a public place? And are the landowners okay with it? And now, Arkansas is very blessed that we have these monuments because most states don't have any recognition for these large trees. And uh, they've really done a lot of good work to uh, get these trees recognized so folks can go out and visit them and uh, just know they're there. My name is Jack Culpepper. They claim that I've never found a rock that I didn't like. And that's uh, what I'm doing now is cutting plaques into the rocks. I've probably got about uh, 35 or 40 plaques cut in so far. The older the rock is, the softer it is to cut, and the more sand stone it is, the easier it is to cut, where it doesn't take as long to get it, cut a plaque in. Each rock has a has a different character to it. I, I just enjoy using rock and fitting them in the, in the places and uh, doing something that looks natural. Plaques and everything will go out to the different counties in Arkansas where the champion trees are located. And both the name, the common name, and the scientific name is on the plaque. It'll be there for children to learn uh, the names of the trees and I really do it like that because it's a good educational tool. One reason people might be interested in trees that endure, like the redwoods in California, or the champion trees right here in Arkansas, is 
because these trees are a form of sublimity or, or a form of wonder, there's something that shatters our notions of the human frame of reference. A tree, a champion tree, can last long, long time, much longer than a human life. Trees out there, not unlike the champion trees, that stretch back so far in history. If you see one of those cross sections of the tree, and you see all of those rings marking time, um, scientists can look at the weather patterns based on the record written in the trees, and how long do those records go? Far past the length or, uh, of our own country. I read something years ago that I really think is interesting, and it said, a work of art is not completed until the viewer brings their response to the artist's statement. To have my work exhibited throughout the state has been overwhelming for me. Uh, it's a dream come true, uh, something I really never expected. It is, you know, an affirmation maybe of what you're doing, what you've been doing in your life, to, to have it exhibited. As executive director of an arts and science center, it's not often that we have something that melds both arts and science. And because she's been so scientifically accurate to the botanical side of things, we can use it to teach both the science and we can use it to teach the art because it's also exquisite art in terms of how she's rendered these botanical specimens, but using colored pencils. Have we really taken time to look at a tree as a work of art? They're unusual, actually, in the history of art. They're usually the background. They're usually one little focal point. And what Linda did was take them and pull them forward to be the central image, really important placement on the uh, paper. And so I thought, this is wonderful. We're celebrating a natural resource. We're celebrating her artistic ability. We're celebrating a history of our state. What could be better than that? I think one of the best comments that I have heard from people is, I look at trees in a different way. All of a sudden, they notice the trees. And, you know, we, Arkansas is so blessed to have so many trees that sometimes we just take them for granted, don't pay any attention. But my exhibit, by focusing on the trees, has brought this to a lot of people's attention, so they see them differently. Well, I feel like it's very important because these trees are very old, and they've been here, they tell a lot of history. I'm a, a real fan of trees, and uh, the idea of, of uh, spending uh, part of a lifetime painting the biggest, most splendid trees of Arkansas, is, uh, it's a cool idea, so we wanted to come and see the exhibit. Her love and the time and devotion that she has spent um, with this project. Through Linda's work, we'll, we'll have a you know, good memory of those trees, those big trees through time. I think it's a wonderment that they still exist. Odds are against their survival. The fact that the trees survive, whether because they were cared for or through benign neglect that they still exist, that they weren't cut down during different eras of Arkansas's history is really remarkable. And I think it represents both artwork today and that historic record. It also preserves it for the future in the event that the trees don't make it another hundred years. I think that's the meaning and the reason this has all taken place for me to create uh, these drawings of the trees. These large trees are something to protect and uh, to be celebrated. I think it will help preserve large trees and hope that in some way uh, my drawings would feature them so that people would recognize them and think, oh, you know, this is a champion tree. This is something to be proud of and to protect. In terms of champion trees, I think folks should just uh, go out there and maybe recognize some of them, uh, go visit them, 
and just marvel at the uh, overall size and uh, uniqueness of them because uh, you know we've, we've all seen big trees but when we truly see the largest one it uh, it's sometimes breathtaking I, I've always been attracted or, or found a, an appeal to looking at the very large trees uh, that we the few that we have on the landscape as I've gone through the years and my career has developed in, in forestry research I find it it's something I can incorporate into to help people get a feel for both how big these trees were but also how these old trees are, are records of the history of the events of this country until you go out and look, look up the trees and figure out which one's which and what a champion tree is you don't know that you might have the champion tree in your yard but it's just always been part of the family. I mean, you know, you just don't pay attention to things that's in your front yard when, <laughs> when you should be paying attention to them. When you see the tree, it's still, it's still a surprise that they're that large. Even though each tree is different, there is that, that awe that you feel standing in front of a tree like that. It's, it's a difficult feeling to express, and I think awe probably is the word, a feeling of reverence that I feel these huge trees are one of God's most magnificent creations. And I, that's how I see them. And there's a feeling of being very insignificant in a way in the whole story of things in this world. Nature's not just over there. Nature's all around us. And we have to encounter, we have to experience nature. Because we are nature, we're in nature. By experiencing the closeness of trees, the power and potencies of trees, it allows us to branch out uh, of our normal ways of thinking. It allows us to experience different forms of thought. One of the advantages of these sorts of encounters with the natural world is that they allow us to experience a kind of modesty. We're here for a short time. Trees and many other living creatures will be here long after we're gone. How do we respect these creatures? How do we respect this earth?
Major funding for Champion Trees was provided by the Morris Foundation, the Horace C. Cabe Foundation, the Wingate Charitable Foundation, and the Richard W. Averill Foundation. Additional funding was provided by the Monroe Foundation, the C. Lewis and Mary C. Cabe Foundation, the Olds Foundation, the Jane Howard Foundation, Carco International, and Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Hawkins. Anyone that's around trees as a child feels that enchantment. We know all about the enchanted forest. We read about it in fairy tales, and I think that's just something that somehow is within us. 